This is something I've never seen before, even after covering over 700 mobile games, because it's an action RPG that used to be a pay-to-win gacha game, but that has now removed all of its gacha mechanics and instead become a premium game, and it somehow actually pulled it off successfully. So today we'll check that one out alongside three other great mobile games, one of which, by the way, is one of the most highly polished turn-based strategy PvP games I have ever seen on mobile. And I don't want to string you guys along by placing these games at the end of the video, so let's instead just dive straight into the Gacha Gun Premium game, Dragon Spear EX. This is an offline playable 2D side-scrolling action RPG with fluid combat, online co-op raid bosses, and no energy systems, ads, or in-app purchases. The core gameplay in this game is split into challenges chapters of 8 levels and then a boss fight. And during these levels, enemies storm at us from all sides, while we then move around and use normal attacks to charge up mana for these over-the-top skills that deal a ton of damage. But that's just the basics though, because if we play well enough to gain S rank in every level of a chapter, we then unlock its raid boss, which we can then fight alone or, and this is where the co-op comes in, with a team of up to 3 other players. I gotta say though, that while these co-op raids are great fun if you have some friends to play them with, I do have a feeling that we're just oftentimes matched with bots if no random players are around. Equipping and upgrading loot is a big part of this game and I really like that and unlike some mobile RPGs our gear is also visually shown on our character which just makes it all the more immersive. But the game actually takes it one step further by adding another system I don't see too often in mobile RPGs which is that by defeating bosses we gain materials that we can then use to add set bonuses and if we equip multiple set bonus pieces we then unlock huge benefits such as stun resistance. When it comes to the art style the combat effects and animations are great in Dragon Spear, and the rock music also perfectly fits the fast-paced gameplay. The game's biggest downsides, in my opinion at least, are that first of all, the characters are overly sexualized, and secondly, although the touch controls are alright, there is no controller support, and this game would be perfect with controller support. Now, you could definitely argue that the storyline isn't exactly thrilling either, and the English translation is sort of so-so, but the gameplay and nicely paced progression thankfully help make up for that. In fact, it only takes a few days to reach the cap with a character, after which it is admittedly a bit unclear what we're supposed to do, but with 6 fun character classes that each have unique weapons and skills, there's at least quite a bit of replayability. In many ways, Dragon Spear EX is a 4 dollars premium game that feels like the type of game that would just be full of gacha mechanics, and the absence, now that they've been removed from the game, is honestly refreshing. It can be played offline, it takes up 645 megabyte of space, and it is definitely worth taking for a spin for any fan of 2D action RPGs. Next up is one of the most unique games I've played this year, and also, by the way, one that I got recommended by you guys over and over again called Phobies. And thank you for that recommendation by the way, because this is a fun turn-based tactical strategy game with an absolutely gorgeous art style, both asynchronous and real-time multiplayer, and a card collecting element where we gather Phobies that each represent an irrational fear manifested as a creature. So imagine this game takes place on a hex grid field where we have three keys per turn that we use to spawn our Phobies. And each Phobie has a key cost, it has stats that define how much damage it deals, how far it can move and how much health it has, and some of them even have unique abilities. We win the game by destroying the opponent's heart on the other side of the playing field and we can do that either by moving our phobies across the map to attack the heart directly or, interestingly, by controlling points of interest that damage the heart every turn. Other points of interest also increase our attack stats or even heal our phobies every turn, quickly making the combat experience highly tactical, which I really love. Actually, I think unlike every single other card-based or unit-based PvP game that I've played at least, we don't actually create a deck in phobies. Instead, we can basically just spawn any any unit in any match, and in between matches we then of course upgrade our phobies to make them stronger, or open card packs that contain new ones. Now thankfully since the primary game mode is asynchronous multiplayer, we can play 10 of these matches at a time so we don't have to wait around so much for the enemies to take their turn, but the game does also feature real time matches, friendly battles, and even a single player challenge mode. I think what most impressed me with phobies though, is just that the entire game oozes of high production quality and polish, even right from the beginning of the game where there's a humorous voice tutorial NPC that guides us through the basics of the game. And actually, you know, even if you don't want to play the rest of the game, you should really download it just to experience that tutorial because it's frankly, one of the best tutorials ever made in any mobile game in my opinion. But the million dollar question is, does the monetization of this game then ruin the fun gameplay? Because Phobies does after all monetize through inner purchases that we can use to quickly unlock and upgrade our units. Thankfully though, through gameplay we also earn a currency used to unlock free packs. And although there is a cap on how many free packs we could open per day, we can always continue playing the game to earn the currency used to upgrade Phobies and also progress towards the weekly and the seasonal rewards. You have to be online to play the game, it takes up 335 megabyte of space 
place, and although the monetization definitely gives paying players a pay to progress fast advantage, the game is still worth checking out for its solid gameplay, unique take on the genre, and the cross-platform play between Android, iOS, and even PC players. The third game today is a semi-open world 3D action RPG called Quest Hunter, and it features a story-driven questline, neat cell shaded graphics, and four-player online co-op with cross-play functionality. The semi-open game world consists of a series of locations full of monsters, randomly generated dungeons, and NPCs that progress the story through humorous quests and conversations. But my favorite part of this world is that there's even buried treasure hidden throughout, with subtle visual cues revealing where we should dig to discover a chest full of riches, which honestly gives the game a neat, adventurous feeling that I really appreciate. Almost everywhere we go in this world, we have to fight back monsters and bosses using our standard attack and a range of skills that we unlock as we progress in the game. The monsters all hit really hard though, and we have oh so very little HP in this game, so to avoid getting attacked, we have to light torches to scare away the monsters around us. Great, we're safe then, right? Well, the issue is that we have a limited supply of these torches, so we have to be very strategic about when to use them, and that is where the game gets really tricky. Throughout the game, we also destroy trees, ores, and crates to gather resources used to craft new equipment and potions, and while we do lose some of these resources in our inventory when we die, we simply respawn at our camp or at the start of the dungeon, so although we die easily, the death penalty isn't crushing. The biggest downside of Quest Hunter is that character customization is limited to basically equipping loot and upgrading one of four core stats such as HP and damage, which means the traditional action RPG experience is somewhat basic in this game. Quest Hunter is free to play for the first few locations, after which a single $9.99 US dollar in-app purchase unlocks the full game. It is relatively pricey for a mobile game and it can be completed in just about 15 hours of gameplay, but it also features a decent amount of replayability and the trial version means that we can at least evaluate the game before then potentially buying the full version. It can be played offline, takes up 659 megabytes of space, and I can't shake the feeling that it plays a bit like a less hack and slash focused Eternium, which is a game I really enjoyed, so I think this one is worth checking out, and at the very least for the free trial version. And now for what I can best describe as a game that I just... <laughs> I just really didn't see this one coming, guys, because it's a Brick Breaker RPG by Artero developer Happy called Punball that mixes typical Brick Breaker gameplay with the roguelike progression of Artero. So what that means is that our character is positioned at the bottom of the screen and we simply aim where to shoot, but then instead of bricks, we hit enemies with HP that move one step closer every time our turn ends. New enemies, of course, also spawn at the top of the screen, and in true RPG style, some of them attack from afar because they're ranged, while others don't deal damage before they reach at the bottom. Throughout a playthrough, as we deal with these enemies, we acquire additional balls so we can deal more damage per attack, and occasionally also, surprise surprise, get to pick one of three random temporary power-ups. And I gotta give it to this game, some of these power-ups are surprisingly fun and even almost game-changing, creating a unique break-breaker experience that gets more interesting the longer we survive in the game. And the only downside is that we're not told what these power-ups do before we select them. Now, our goal is to survive all the way to round 40 so we can defeat the boss and then continue to the next area. And when our playthrough ends, we gain some some gold and loot that we use to buy permanent upgrades or equip and upgrade gear to make the next playthrough easier. Punball monetizes through a very high number of push in-app purchases that make us stronger, incentivized ads for some free rewards, and then an energy system where we get to play only three runs before we have to either wait or spend real-life money. The good news is that the in-app purchases aren't necessary to progress at a decent pace in the game, but the monetization still isn't amazing. Thankfully, each run is rather lengthy though, so we do get around 30 minutes of playtime before running out of energy. The game could be played offline, takes up 341 megabytes of space, and the core gameplay loop is both polished and addictively fun, so if you can ignore the energy system, you might actually still really enjoy this game. My favorite game this week has got to be Phobies, followed by either Dragon Spear or maybe even Punball, despite the monetization system. But let me know if you agree or disagree on what your favorite game was in the comment section down below, and leave a like if you enjoyed the video, because then, until next time, just keep gaming, stay awesome, and I'll see you guys around.